Colossians chapter 1. Hallelujah. Amen. Colossians chapter 1. If you're there, say amen. 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 We're going to begin in the ninth verse. I'm going to read a little bit, a little bit here this morning. Colossians 1, beginning in the ninth verse. For this cause, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. And to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will, God's will, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. The Apostle Paul is telling the church of Colossus that they, he desires and he's praying for them that they would be filled with the knowledge of the will of God, that they would have all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Meaning if there's anything the believer should be increasing in, it is only the knowledge of the things of God. We should be decreasing every single day in the knowledge of self, the knowledge of the world, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Giving thanks unto the Father which has made us meet or has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life. The Catholic Church cannot make you a saint. Jesus makes us a saint. If you are a born-again believer, you are a saint right now. You are a child of God. To call the Apostle Paul Saint Paul or Saint Peter or Saint John is no more than identifying them as simply a child of God. You are a saint if you be in Christ Jesus. He says he, that God, through what Jesus has done, has made us a partaker of to inherit the inheritance of the saints in life. Who has delivered us from the power of darkness. This is where I want to begin in our text here really this morning. Who has delivered us from the power of darkness. And has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. In whom we have redemption through his blood. Even the forgiveness of sins who is the image of the invisible God. Meaning when Jesus was incarnate, when he came as a, as a baby born of the Virgin Mary, as he was brought into this world and put on flesh, and as he grew up, he is the image of the invisible God. He is the Son of God. He is deity. He is God. The firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. Everything is made by God. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things are created by him and for him. If you believe in evolution, then you do not believe in the Bible. Evolution is a lie. Everything was made by God, for God, period. And in verse 17, and is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Amen. This morning's message is entitled The Superiority of Jesus Christ. The Superiority of Jesus Christ. Father, we come to you this morning. I pray that you would anoint my words. I pray that you would give me the words to preach. Nothing of me and all of you. I pray that you would touch the hearts of the hearers, that they would hear by faith. 
and that you would prepare the heart to receive the planting of your word, that it would bring forth an increase of fruit of righteousness. I pray, Father, that every power of darkness, every work of Satan would be bound. And in the name of Jesus, may Jesus Christ be lifted up here in this place this morning and through this message. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Jesus came, in verse 13, to deliver us from the powers of darkness. Satan and every power of darkness, every principality that he had, and let it be known, the believer must understand that he is in a spiritual battle. Everything we look at here in this life is tangible. It can be consumed. It can and will be burnt up. Everything, if we look at our homes, if we look at our cars, if we look at anything in this life, even the body can be consumed and be no more. Everything in this life is tangible and it is, it is vain. It is able to be destroyed. But that which is eternal, you cannot see. Everything, even your soul, even your spirit, you cannot see it. But it will live on for all of eternity in either heaven or hell. Everything that is seen, that you see with your eye, is, is able to be burned up and to be destroyed. And if we put our faith and hope in what we see here, we are putting it in a short-lived experience. The believer has traded in this life for eternal life. If we haven't done that, then this life is the best life you're ever going to get. Because it won't get no better than right here if this is where our hope is. So there really isn't a whole lot of hope for the believer. Because this, this is it. After this, it's the judgment and eternal damnation forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever ending. But for the believer, this life is only a, an alien place. It is not my home anymore. And my hope is in heaven where I know that moth and rust and the things of fire cannot consume it. It will endure the flames that will try to, to, to lick up at it. And the powers of darkness are at work within every single soul to seek, to destroy, to kill, to, to uproot, we just were praying for uh, families and, and marriages and that covenant of marriage. And we see as marriage has been attacked for the past 30, 40, 50 years, you can see that as the attack against the family has happened, so has the, the falling of righteousness and holiness and the preaching of truth in the church. Yes. Because marriage is an example, is a type of our relationship, the church, with Jesus Christ, Amen. our Lord. Amen? Amen? And so that is not because of the culture change. That is not because times are different. It's because Satan is attacking and believers are no longer looking through eyes of spiritual eyes, but they're acting out of the flesh. Jesus came to deliver us from the powers of darkness. Hallelujah. Meaning, nothing that Satan can do can hurt you. That's right. He cannot destroy you. And even the trials that you face right now, the Lord might allow the, the, these trials to come, but they can't, they can't kill you. Even these trials might be so unbearable to that you think, I ain't going to make it. But if your faith is in Jesus, Hallelujah. it won't kill you. It might hurt you. It might feel like you're going through the fires of hell itself, but it won't kill you. You will come out on the other end if your faith is in Christ Jesus. If your faith's not in Jesus Christ, it will kill you. And there's no hope. That's pretty gloomy. That's the way it is. It's Jesus or nothing. There's no inter intermediate. There's no other little place that you can go to other than Jesus. It's either all in or get out. Don't ride the fence. The powers of darkness have, have been broken by the power of Jesus Christ. He's delivered us from Satan's clutch of sin and death. And he has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, Jesus. In whom we have redemption through his blood. Redemption, we have forgiveness of sins. We have justification by faith. He has taken us from where we were 
And because of the blood of Jesus, what he did at Calvary's cross, he has brought us out of darkness into light. He was the image of the invisible God. What I want to leave with you here this, this morning is this. Jesus cannot and has never been defeated. Amen. He is the absolute, undisputed, undefeated <laughs> champion of the world. Woo! There is nothing that he cannot conquer and has not already conquered. Yes. And if you be in Christ Jesus, hell or high water can't come against you. Yes. It might feel like it's tough. It might feel like you're, you're, you're at the verge. And I've been there many a time where I thought that wave was going to take me. It was the last one to come. But every single time I looked up to Jesus and he would take me that close. Just to prove he's there in the midst of it. And he's brought me out every single time. Every trial and every tribulation. It's felt like I was going to drown. But it never killed me. He always brought me to the other side. Amen? Amen. Jesus Christ and his work at the cross has made you in him superior than everything that, that there is out there. It says in verse 8 or verse 17. And he is... Before all things, and by him all things consist. Which means not only did God, did Jesus make everything, but he continues to let it be made. God made this world, and like I said about evolution, evolution is a diabolical lie from Satan. It in itself is a theory. Fifty years ago it was... If you believed in evolution, you were thought of as a loony person. But today, it's taught in our public schools, and it is taught in our colleges as if it is fact. And it's no more than a theory. And yet, it's a diabolical lie, because if you can't acknowledge God as creator, you aren't ever going to acknowledge him as savior. So if Satan can get us to get off of the principle of you are made in the image of God, by God, for God, this world was made by him and for him, and it is sustained continuously by him. Which means if you cut down a tree, and I'll tell you, I had a tree of heaven, which if you know anything about trees of heaven, I don't know how they got their name. But they are the dirtiest tree that they just sprout up bunch of, and their limbs are weak. They're not a real strong tree. And I had a giant tree of heaven in my front yard when we bought our house. And I hated it. The moment I seen it, it was, ow, tree of heaven. But it came with the house. And it was big. So I wouldn't, and it was right next to the house. Well, the Lord fights for me. He loves me a lot. No sooner we got in there, all of a sudden AEP was bringing that tree cutting crew through and taking out all the trees under the power lines. And that tree of heaven was right underneath the power line. And they come along and we, they said, we want to cut down that big old tree. And I said, thank you. They come along and I stood in our window and watched as they took that big boom and they chopped it up piece by piece, squirted that that chemical around the stump so it would rot faster. And I said, praise God, it's out of here. But I kept on mowing over tree of heaven shoots, coming up in my landscape and coming up, even after that thing was cut out and chopped up into mulch. For two years I was mowing over and plucking out them tree of heavens growing up in our lilac bushes in our they were everywhere. Finally, I've, I've gotten a handle on them. I think I finally cursed them enough in the name of Jesus that they're gone. But, but such, a, such a, a dirty tree. God made even all plant life of that to be consistent. He not only made it, he made it to continue. You cut down a tree, another one's going to pop up. You cut your grass, next week you'll have to cut it again. Amen? Amen. He made it be sustainable. He didn't just make a beautiful earth and then that's it. He, it says he made it and he through him it consists. It continues. God continues to allow this earth to reproduce 
and to sustain itself. All this stuff about global warming that they talk about on television, my entire belief system in absolutely every aspect of my life, whether it be what I eat, whether it be what I think, everything is based upon the Bible. Now, I'm all for, and you won't catch me pouring motor oil on the ground, and I don't litter, and I don't like to see people litter. I, I like to, this God has made us this beautiful earth, and he has entrusted us to be a, a good partaker of it. We ought to do our best to keep this earth as best as possible. But when they tell me that the, 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 the ice glaciers are melting, and that in a hundred years we're going to be the new ice age and you'll be vacationing in the North Pole in your, on the beach in your swimming shorts. I don't believe it because the Bible doesn't say it. In fact, the Bible says that Jesus Christ is going to come back. And when he comes back, at that moment there's going to be a great tribulation. The rapture of the church is gone. He that let it will let until he be taken out of the way. And then that man of sin will be revealed, the Antichrist. He will set himself up. And it's not going to be, we think to ourselves, that the Antichrist is going to be an atheist. He's not an atheist. He, he sets himself up as God. And he commands everyone else to worship him. And for seven years there will be the worst time. And maybe this is strange to some people to hear what I'm saying. This is called the Great Tribulation, and the Bible foretells it. It is going to happen as sure as I'm standing here right now. It is going to happen, and I ain't going to be here to witness it. Because of what Jesus Christ did for me, I believe in him by faith. Hallelujah. That tribulation is going to take place. The whole purpose of the tribulation is the Antichrist wants to destroy Israel. And God is going to allow all of these horrible things to happen in order to get Israel to finally repent. And look to Jesus as their Savior. And when it is about at the last bell, the last hour, the last chance they have, the Antichrist is coming in and he's gathering in to destroy Israel. The Bible says at that moment Israel will cry out to Jesus Christ as their Savior. And at that moment there is going to be a split in the eastern sky. And Jesus Christ is going to come back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And it says he'll be riding upon a white horse and the saints of heaven will be with him. That's me and you if you be in Christ Jesus. And we will come back and it says when Jesus steps foot, he will step foot on the Mount of Olivet in Jerusalem. And as the moment as his, his foot steps on this earth one more time and the soil feels the presence, the weight of its creator upon itself, it says the Mount of Olives is going to experience an earthquake that the world has never experienced before. And the Mount of Olives will be split in two. Praise God. Jesus is coming. After that, it says when Jesus comes back, he will set up a millennial reign. For a thousand years, he will reign on this very earth. I'm not concerned about global warming. Because my faith is in Jesus. Amen. 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 He has made it and he made it good. When he saw his creation, he said, it's good. Yes. So I trust that he knows how to make stuff. Amen? He's able to sustain it. Yes. Jesus Christ is superior to all things. Verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church. Who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Meaning that when Jesus rose from the dead... He was the first to truly be resurrected in resurrection power, never to die again. Lazarus was resurrected from the dead. Elijah laid upon a dead boy and breathed by the power of God life into him. And there had been many other resurrections from the dead before Jesus, but never for eternity. Every one of those people, Lazarus being raised from the dead, died later. Every one of those people who experienced a resurrection lived a little longer and then death came. But Jesus was the first to be raised from the dead and receive a glorified body. Never, ever, ever to die again. He is still upon the throne today. He is superior to all things. 
And I hope to get across to you this morning, no matter what you're facing, no matter what you're looking at, no matter how big that mountain is, that river crossing may be wide, Jesus Christ is superior to it all. And if your faith be in him and what he did for you at Calvary's cross, redemption through his blood, you are also superior to it all. Yes. Nothing can harm you. That's right. I believe with all my heart that, that the man of God cannot die until he has finished his work. You say, well, that's pretty strange. I believe with all my heart. I believe that God is preeminent in all things. I believe God has a work for certain people. And he has a plan for certain people. And no matter what Satan might do to try to come against them, if they be in the will of God, there is not one plan that Satan can bring against a child of God that will conquer and that will defeat them until God has accomplished his work for that person. And when that person's work has been accomplished, God will allow them to go home. Yes. Amen? Amen? Jesus Christ is preeminent. He is superior to all things. And if you be in Christ Jesus, you be in his boat. Yes. Amen? Yes. An unsinkable ship. The best man can do sinks. We all know about the old Titanic. Was that 1910? 1912. The unsinkable ship. Even God himself can't sink this ship. First maiden voyage. It sunk. That's what man can do. But you be in the boat, you be in the ship of Jesus, it is an unsinkable ship. I'd rather be adrift on a raft with Jesus than on any man-made ship. Amen? Any man-made ship. The Titanic proves it'll sink. Still down there now in cold water. I'd rather be on a, on a tube with Jesus. Amen? Praise God. Me and Jesus will go tubing. I'd rather be with him on the waves of this life than in anything that man thinks that they can do to help me. Because Jesus is through and through. He is superior to all things. And I hope to leave with you, to encourage you this morning, if your faith is resting in Him, if you're submitting to Him, following Him, not your way, not your will, but His will, then you also be superior to the works of darkness. But let me tell you where it falls and where it, where it fails. We get our eyes off of Jesus. We get our eyes off of what He did. And we begin to fail. We begin to sink. And we, if we continue in that way, we will drown. We will drown. But if we look up and say, Jesus, if we look up to the one, he reaches down his hand every time. Oh, yes. Pulls us up out of that water. Just like Peter. Amen? Amen? Pulls us out of that water. The Bible says that Jesus was on a ship. I'm closing. Jesus was on a ship asleep. In the front. And there was a storm that started to blow. The disciples thought for sure that they were going to drown. This was it. This was the end of the, of the road. And all of a sudden they woke up Jesus and they said, Do you not care that we're all going to drown? You're asleep and we're going we're to die. Jesus said, You have little faith. See, the faith is what floats. Amen? Amen? And not just faith in anything, because you can have faith in a tree stump, and it ain't going to get you nowhere. But it's faith in what Jesus has already done for you, a finished work. He says, you have little faith. And it says, he looked up at the wind and the, and the seas, and he rebuked them. And instantly. When the Bible says instantly, I believe it's instantly. Instantly. The waves stop. The wind stopped, and everything became calm. A beautiful sea breeze. Amen? <laughs> a beautiful sea breeze. Yes, amen. Instantly, it stopped. And they said, what kind of man is this? They didn't fully know it at the time, but the Son of God, the creator of all things, who is superior to all things, who is preeminent, in all things was in the boat with him. I want to ask you this morning, who's in your boat? Bow your heart with me. Who's in your boat? Yes. 